Hey everybody! Today's video is a little different than what I've done up to this point, as I want to take some time to talk about building and maintaining a smart home, something I am passionate about and have been doing for a few years, for better or worse. When I purchased my new home a few years ago, I was adamant that one of the things I wanted to do was really go down into the smart home rabbit hole, and it's a deep one. I had tried a few IoT devices in the past, smart bulbs, smart speakers, but for the most part, I'd been unimpressed. But I knew that there was something to this. What I want to talk about in this video are the aspects that I took into consideration when deciding on hardware, software, and the methodology of building my smart home, and how those decisions did or did not work. And hopefully, these processes and considerations will help you to make sure that your smart home isn't, well, dumb. Who you calling good at? First off, why build a smart home? Well, a smart home is a solution, which means that there must be a problem. Our new home was quite a bit larger than our previous one, and it had way more switches. In fact, it had so many switches that the previous homeowner had not figured out what many of them did in all the years that they had lived here, which to me seemed absurd until I started counting. By my last count, there are 36 light switches in the house, and keeping track of which are which and where can be a bit of a chore. For example, the switch that controls the soffit lights on the back of the house is near a staircase in the center of the house. And while I want to move this switch to be physically near the exit, at least getting that switch labeled would be helpful, and controlling it via automation would allow me to at least control this switch from other locations to try and make it more intuitive. Another thing that led me to want a smart home was the lighting layout. Our kitchen has two rows of five can lights as well as pendants that hang over the kitchen island. On the first row, four cans were controlled by a four-way switch pair. That is where there are three switches that can all be used to control the lights. This also controlled the pendant lights. Then, there was a three-way switch that controlled a second row of four. As you may have noticed, that only accounts for eight of the ten can lights, and you'd be correct. The last two are controlled by yet another switch. So there are six switches to control 13 lights in the kitchen. At least to me, this should logically just be two zones of lights instead of three, the cans and the pendants. But the pendants are tied to the first rows of cans, so you can't control them separately without rewiring, which is expensive and intrusive. Or this could be done through the integration of some smart switches or smart lighting. So when deciding that you want to build out a smart home, Start with making a list of the problems that you want to address. Are you just looking to automate specific tasks to save time? Or are you trying to make a lighting circuit work in a different way? Or are there other problems that you want to solve? Some additional examples. Saving money with efficiency improvements, such as turning off the air conditioning if the windows are open, is another valid problem that a smart home could solve. The next thing I want to talk about is smart home adoption. So, you have some problems that you found and you want to address these with a smart home. Now you can't wait to fill your cart full of smart home devices, but maybe your family or significant other is hesitant to give their blessing to take on this new project. A common mistake when first starting a smart home is to dive in too deep too quickly. It will take some time for you to get used to the platform that you opt to use. There will be some growing pains and making those learning curves and growing pains everyone else's problem is a quick way to get asked to just remove all of the smart home devices. Start small. Take one of the problems that you have identified and decide how to address that one problem first. Once you have implemented your solution, take some time to see how it works. What are its shortcomings and what can you take away from it to do better next time? When deciding which problem to tackle first, choose one that is in an area of the house that will have minimal impact while you implement the solution. Once you have learned the platform a little, and the family has started to adopt the solution successfully, the idea of expanding into the rest of the house, zone by zone, will be a much more comfortable conversation and one the family or your SO is hopefully more excited for. So, how do you decide what to smartify? Okay, so you've decided to tackle a problem, whatever it is, and now it's time to decide what you're actually going to replace with a smart device. Maybe you have a light that you want to control. So you find a smart bulb compatible with the light socket type. Is that the right decision? What's going to happen when someone flips the light switch and the smart light no longer turns on with your phone controls? So you have to get up and go flip the switch anyways. 
Now you have to hope that your smart bulb will remember the settings that you had applied to it when you reapply power. Are smart bulbs always the wrong decision? Well, no. They are an answer for some things, but not all things. When deciding on what you want to make smart, remember that a smart home is here to add features and add functionality to your home. It is never there to remove or replace it. If the only way that you can control something after making it smart is from your phone or a smart speaker, when previously it could be controlled from a physical control, you're making a fairly common mistake. And it's only a matter of time before this becomes a pain point, especially if at any point your smart home platform is down and now you can't control that device. Or maybe you have a guest who you don't want to implement into your smart home, but still needs to be able to control that particular light or device. When laying out your plan, Plan for your smart home platform to be down. Plan for the worst case scenario. It's easy to see all the great things a smart home can do when it works, but building it smartly means doing it in a way where the home is still functional without the smart home platform. So how do we do this? Well, in the example of the smart bulb, do you need the functions that are unique to a smart bulb, such as dimmability, temperature or hue control, or color control? If not, a smart switch may be a better option. If you do want those types of controls, the answer may be to pair a smart bulb with a smart switch. How does that work? Well, first let's talk about the difference between logical and electrical controls. Electrical control is when a device is controlled by disconnecting the electrical power from it via a physical disconnect, like a light switch. Logical controls or when the device receives a signal from another device like your smart home or smartphone, and that signal tells the device to power itself off. However, a small amount of power will still be used to keep the logic circuit online so that it can continue to receive commands to power itself back on, on request. This is why using a smart bulb downstream of a normal light switch is such a problem. Once the switch is flipped, there is no power for that logic control to stay on. A smart switch on its own is just an electrical control of the downstream lights or outlets, whichever it happens to be, and there is a logical control on the light switch that can be used to control the relay that powers the downstream devices. So where you just need on, off, or dimmer controls, a smart switch or smart dimmer is likely preferable. But as mentioned before, how do we use smart switches and smart bulbs together? Well. Many smart switches feature a smart bulb mode. What this does is disables the internal relay and instead leaves power connected to the downstream bulb anyways. Now, you can use the logic controls of the light bulb to control them, and you can create automations to trigger when you use the physical buttons of the smart switch to turn the bulbs on and off. Now, how does this work when the platform is down? Well, there are two ways. First, if your switches have an easy way to switch between smart bulb and standard modes, if your platform is down and those automations that link the bulbs to the switch are down, you can switch back to electrical controls. There are some extra steps here to set this up correctly. For example, you'll want to make sure that your smart bulbs turn on automatically when power is reconnected. The second way to do this is to use something like Zigbee groups or Z-Wave device associations which allow devices to communicate directly with each other even if your platform is down. You will need to make sure your devices support this feature and that your bulbs and switches are on the same protocol. For example, Zigbee or Z-Wave. So what I did in the example of my kitchen from earlier was remove the three-way configurations from each set of lights, leaving only one switch in each entryway. Each of these switches electrically controls one section of the lights, as they were when we bought the house. However, I put in smart bulbs and smart cans throughout the kitchen, and now, when I press one of the light switches in any of the three locations, all my kitchen lights turn on, and a double press will turn on just the pendants. In the case that my smart platform is offline, I can tap on any of these switches 10 times to put them back into standard electrical controls, and then control each of these relevant electrical zones, just like when we bought the house. However, I am likely to switch these switches out for Zigbee switches in the future so that I can use that Zigbee grouping that I was talking about earlier and group the lights to the controls on the wall. All that is to say, anytime you implement a smart home automation or device, it should be to add functionality. 
In the case of my kitchen, I have simplified the controls of the lights, but done so in a way that it is intuitive for my family or guests to be able to operate. But that doesn't leave us stranded if something isn't working. So, what platform do we use? Throughout this video, I've said smart home platform more times than I care to, so let's get into that. The platform you decide on is where and how you intend to control your smart home. Not all smart devices are cross-compatible, and there are so many protocols out there that you can use to control things. For example, any given device may be able to be controlled by Zigbee, Thread, Z-Wave, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, radio frequency, Matter. Some can be controlled by multiple. Some require hubs. Some don't. What should you be looking for? Well, first, decide on a controller. My controller of choice is Home Assistant which is a self-hosted platform that you can integrate all of your platforms into. It's robust and feature-rich with the ability to add most other platforms. However, you could also opt to control everything from Apple HomeKit via a Home Hub or an Apple TV, or you could buy another of the myriad of smart home hubs on the market. Once you've decided on your controller, note what protocols it can handle, what devices they list as compatible, and use this list to drive your purchasing decision. There's nothing worse than finding out you bought a smart device that doesn't support your hub, and it has to be integrated via a different hub or controller, and now you have multiple controllers that you have to link together in software, creating a bunch of extra failure points. Again, this is why I like Home Assistant. I can add the protocols that I want to use via dongles, but it's not for everyone. The next thing on your checklist should be devices that can be controlled locally. What do I mean by this? Well. Some devices require an internet connection to be able to talk back to their manufacturers in order to function. These types of devices are riddled with potential problems. What if the internet's down? What if the manufacturer goes bankrupt? What if the manufacturer stops supporting that device? What if an update breaks that device? For this reason, I prefer protocols like Zigbee and Z-Wave that do not require a network connection at all beyond for being controlled and communicating over local direct communication. If you have a Wi-Fi based devices, look for things that support HomeKit or Matter or some other local control like an API. Cloud dependency for anything critical to home functionality is an absolute no for me when building our smart home. We do have cloud dependent devices. I have a pair of Dyson fans controlled through a Home Assistant integration that is cloud dependent. However, to me these are non-critical devices and they have remotes and physical controls on them still. Additionally. In my testing, these have worked when the internet was down, as long as the local IP address doesn't change, but I wouldn't rely on it. So at this point in the video, if you're still here listening to me ramble on about smart home design, thank you. Consider subscribing if you wanna see more content like this and let me know in the comment section below. Let's re-summarize these four points we've made today. One, identify the problems and reasons you want a smart home and consider the solutions to those problems. Two, start small and focus on one problem at a time. Three, decide how and what to make smart by considering how you will add functionality without removing or replacing functionality of the home. Four, decide on a platform and look for devices that are compatible with your platform and that support local controls. I think just these four steps will help make your smart home journey a much more enjoyable experience. However, this is hardly where it stops. This is such a deep topic. And if there is interest, I would love to circle back on it again. That's all for today. Until next time, thanks for watching.